Thank you again for joining us for our Wednesday night Bible study and singing. We're going to start off with Come, Now is the Time to Worship. Would you come with us and worship Him?
Welcome back to our Wednesday night Bible study and our journey with Jesus. This is our final Wednesday evening together in the spring of 2020. When we gather next week, we'll be into summer, in case the temperature didn't tell you that. Well, uh, it has been a good week. I trust that God has been good to you. Uh, last week, Coletti and I uh, visited beautiful Lake Sam Rayburn, caught a bunch of fish, had a good time, and uh, glad to be back. Um, a lot of good things happening here around the church. We, um, As of Monday, two days ago, we uh, opened the church for small groups and ministry meetings, and we are adjusting to that, getting ready for uh, when we will start our Wednesday night Bible study in person again. We will continue online, but we'll have it in person and eventually to have Sunday morning worship as well. Well, it's good to see you. Uh, this is Wednesday morning. Our trustees meet tomorrow afternoon, Thursday afternoon, and then um, looking forward to Father's Day. Trust that you, uh, you guys have plans on getting something good to eat for Father's Day. Let's pray, and then we'll get into our Bible study, get back, to, back on the journey with Jesus. Pray with me. Father God, thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, beautiful spring that we've enjoyed and for your hand of protection on us and over us uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we pray, Lord, your continued blessings and ask, Lord, that you give us wisdom to know how to manage life in these days to keep ourselves uh, and our friends and family around us healthy and safe. Uh, we also pray, Lord, that you would uh, help the scientists and researchers to come up with an answer to this pandemic soon. We thank you, Lord, that you will use this for your glory and our good in some way and uh, trust that you will enable us to persevere, uh, not just to get through it, but, Lord, to uh, glorify you in the midst of it. We pray for our church family. Lord, we know that we have, have loved ones who've lost uh, family members in this past week and pray for them as they grieve the loss of loved ones. We have some, Father, who are having surgeries and such and pray, Lord, for our physical well-being. But, Lord, we pray as um, the Bible teaches us that we pray, Father, for our uh, continued spiritual growth. And that's why we're here tonight together is to uh, study your word and our relationship with you that we might grow in the spirit, that we might continue to grow in our Christ-likeness as we uh, give more and more of the control of our lives over to you. Now, Father, we pray that you'll guide us in our understanding, that you'll give us wisdom, Lord, that you will indeed uh, make the word a light unto our paths as we journey with Jesus tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we um, last time had that um, video of Hezekiah's tunnel and the pool of Siloam. I hope that was helpful to you in better understanding the uh, ministry of our Lord and specifically uh, his trip to the temple in Jerusalem. In fact, I want to show you a, a, a slide now of the temple in Jerusalem during the, because Jesus was there during the Feast of the Tabernacles in what I believe to be A.D. 30. Um, and that... Uh, that feast, you know, reminded the people that God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt and provided for them in the wilderness uh, while they were wandering, uh, waiting for uh, that generation to pass on and a generation with uh, greater faith in God to move into the promised land. Uh, just a reminder that that feast is a, um, a, a way of celebrating God is our deliverer and our provider, and we know that Jesus delivers us from the penalty of sin, provides for our eternal life, and uh, as this feast is, um, shows us, he's the light of the world, and uh, he's the living water as well, the Messiah of God. Now, here's a picture of the temple. Well, it's not a picture, is it? Uh, it's a, a painting, a drawing of the temple as uh, someone uh, would suggest that it looked in uh, Jesus' day. Uh, remember that there are remains of this temple still in place in Jerusalem today. You can go there. The western wall is uh, one of the main things. You can go look at the western wall. You can touch it. Uh, you can put your prayer, written prayer request in the cracks of the wall, as many, many people do. Uh, but this is an idea of what the temple looked like in Jesus' day. Just a reminder that uh, the original temple that was built uh, so long ago was destroyed in 586 by the Babylonians when they overtook um, Jerusalem and Judea. And then uh, you remember 
uh, folks like Nehemiah came back and, and uh, tried to rebuild Jerusalem and, and finally some of the temple. But uh, we're talking about hundreds of years later as, um, as uh, uh, Herod now is a leader of the Jews and of the um, people of that day. And Herod wants to ingratiate the Jews. And so he puts a lot of money into rebuilding or building the temple. Beautiful, beautiful structure, uh, larger and more beautiful than ever. And um, in fact, I understand it was still under construction when Jesus was there, and maybe that's some of, some of the things that he talked about with his disciples uh, as they as they walked around the temple area. But if you can see this picture well enough, you can see that uh, on the outer uh, edges of that, it talks about the uh, courtyard or the area of the Gentiles. They they couldn't go inside the temple area, but they could come there to worship. Uh, Gentiles, and then you'll see an area uh, which would be over on the right of the screen. That is the women's uh, court, and then the men's court, and and then the uh, the building there, the structure, the temple itself, uh, with the holy of holies where the the priest would would go. And so the the temple that one was destroyed in 70 A.D. Uh, when the Jews revolted against the Romans, and the Romans. Um, squashed all that and, and uh, destroyed the temple. So uh, J- Jesus is there about 30 A.D. So we're talking uh, 40 years after Jesus was there, the temple was destroyed. But we're there, and tonight we're going to begin in John chapter 7, verse 32. And the interaction, the context of that setting uh, involves the Jewish leadership, uh, many of whom wanted to kill Jesus um, that, that's one group of folks. And then there's the, because it's a great feast time, uh, the festival of the tabernacles or booths, they call it. Um, they, there were many people from out of town all, all around um, the area that we call today uh, Israel. And there were uh, also uh, many, many of those who lived out and about, uh, perhaps up in Galilee and such, who had witnessed Jesus' miracles and his uh, teachings. And there were also the third group then, the residents of, of Jerusalem, who I do not think had seen um, um, much of what Jesus was doing, did not know much about Jesus. And so John tells us about an opinion poll. That is, what, what these people say, what those people say. And he said, some people say that Jesus is a good man. And others say, no, uh, he's not a good man because he leads people astray from the religious convictions of the day, the status quo. And then the locals are, they seem to be in the middle, sort of pulled in both directions, confused, saying our, our leaders, Jewish leaders, want to kill him. But here is this man that they want to kill teaching openly in the public, and they don't stop him. So I think they're scratching their heads wondering, perhaps they think that maybe he is the Messiah or the Greek word for that, the Roman uh, would use, would be the Christ. But then uh, we know, hey, he, he's from Galilee. That would be north, right? The Galilee, Nazareth, or Capernaum. And, and if he were the Messiah... Uh, well, some say, well, we won't know where he comes from, uh, but then uh, how could he be the Messiah? How could he not be the Messiah, considering all the signs and the wonders that he has performed? And so we're picking up in verse 32 of, um, of John chapter uh, 7, and th- we're talking about this um, failed attempt on their part to arrest Jesus. John seven thirty-two. Here's what it says. The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things. And what things are we talking about? The things uh, about who who they think he is and such. Uh, They're whispering such things about him. And then the chief priest and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. We're going to talk about uh, the the temple guards and and such in just a moment. Uh, Jesus said, uh, I'm with you for only a short time, and then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. And the Jews said to one another, "Uh, where does this man intend to go that we cannot find him? Uh, Perhaps they're thinking he'll he'll go into some remote areas or something, go hide out with the Jewish folks who may be, you know, anywhere in the world. Uh, they, they said, well, well, will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? Um, what did he mean when he said, you'll look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? And so let's talk about the 
the, the temple guards and such. Uh, with the Roman conquest of Judea way back in, in 63 uh, B.C., right? So this is, um, you know, a, a, a lifetime, generation before Jesus was born. Uh, 63 B.C., the Romans take over the area. The office of high priest, um, as the Romans come in, they, they uh, control the, this as a political tool in the hands of the Roman administration. Remember, they, they want to uh, what they call Hellenize or make Greek uh, the culture of the day, and so they, they're taking control of many different aspects, administrative aspects of the culture. And so the high priest at that time would be both uh, because of that, would be both secular and religious leaders in the Jewish community. The high priest would serve as the leader of the Sanhedrin, uh, or, or you might call it the Jewish council. Uh, these would be people that uh, the Sanhedrin, they would um, be like the, the court and make decisions about uh, the Jewish people and things that they had done and whatever. In other words, the Romans allowed the Jewish people to have their, their own um, rules within the culture of the greater Roman Empire. And so the, uh, the reference here, John says, is the captain of the temple guard. He's uh, the second in command to the high priest, and he's in charge of the armed temple guard who maintain law and order under the authority of the high priest. And so, uh, again, we have a lot of people coming and going, and uh, uh, around the temple area, there's, uh, a, a, I think, a lot of money uh, product being exchanged there. And so they have they have uh, armed guards there to keep the peace, the law and order. And this is a, a part of what John is talking about. The Jewish council or the Sanhedrin uh, was also a, a religious and somewhat of a political assembly that enforced the religious laws regulating the, the Jewish worship and the day-to-day -day affairs in, in Jerusalem and to some degree throughout all of Judea. But they also held an enforcement role for the civil and the criminal issues but it, it is very evident that they didn't have the power to execute a criminal. Uh, the Romans did that. They kept that authority. And so that's why uh, the Romans, um, the Roman soldiers, put Jesus on the cross, crucified him. Um, prominent members of the council, uh, the Sanhedrin in Jesus' day, included some names that you'll remember. Nicodemus, remember, in John chapter 3. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea. Uh, after Jesus um, was crucified, we, we hear about him. And then there's the mention of Gamaliel, who was uh, Paul's uh, religious tutor, mentor. Um, um, and so there are uh, people that we're aware of that were um, in the Sanhedrin, but they were also very sympathetic to uh, the ministry of our Lord Jesus. And remember, uh, the Romans, uh, one of their key uh, characteristics is they're, they're going to keep the peace. They're all about peace, and they they carried a sword to ensure that that peace was kept throughout the Roman Empire. In fact, that's one of the reasons that the Romans were so big on building highways and roads and such. Uh, they wanted to be able to get their soldiers, their army from one place to another. So if there was a, an uprising, a riot of any sorts, they could get some soldiers there to take care of it promptly. Keep the peace. Pax Romana. Peace of Rome. So they, they uh, held peace in, in high regards, and so they appointed leadership in the Jewish community to work with them or for them to keep the peace among the Jews. And uh, the demonstrations or riots that we're familiar with in, in the United States, would, uh, they would not be allowed in the Roman Empire. Uh, the Roman government would come and squelch that uh, quickly. Uh, but the temple is the focal point of the Jewish community. And so the Romans allowed the Jews to have their culture. But again, um, the, the Jewish people were on a short leash. The Romans, um, they allowed the Jews to do their culture thing, but um, they, the Jews had to pay their taxes and they had to um, keep their peace as well. So the leaders, um, the, leader, the Jewish leaders, said they, they have their interpretation of Jesus' statement about um, going to the one who sent me in verse 33 and 34. And so they have, uh, they, ha they, they have no basis of understanding what we know of as the ascension, that is Jesus going to the Father. And so they interpret it as, as what Jesus is saying, as he's going to slip away, uh, as he has done and will do again. He's going to slip away into the Jewish community. And remember, the Jews, uh, because of the, um, the Babylonians and the 
uh, Assyrians. The, the Jewish people are scattered all, all over the world, and so um, they call this the diaspora. Uh, they're dispersed uh, among the, the Roman world, the Hellenistic world. And so they're thinking that, well, Jesus, he, he's going to run away, and he's going to find a safe place uh, from the attacks of the, the Jewish council, and it's going to be out there among some of the Jewish folks in other parts of the empire or even the world somewhere. And so Jesus is, is um, they're attempting to arrest him, uh, but let's see what happens. Uh, as, he, as he talks about now being the, Jesus being the fulfillment of this feast of tabernacles. Look at John 7, verse 37. John 7, 37. He says, on the uh, last and the greatest day of the feast. Remember, we talked about this, was it last week? We talked about the feast of booths or tabernacles uh, and the significance and that it was a seven-day feast, but they also had a, a day of rest on the beginning and a day of rest at the end. And day eight was the day of rest. And so this is probably day seven that we're talking about, the last and the greatest day of the feast. Jesus stood um, and he said in a loud voice, uh, so he's, he's uh, I assume they're at the temple area, and uh, he's saying in a loud voice because he doesn't have a nice microphone amplification system, saying it in a loud voice where everybody can hear him. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, and he would be referring to the Old Testament, right? As the Scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. But this he meant, by this he meant the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to later uh, to receive. And up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Again, the last day of the feast uh, would probably be the seventh day. Um, but then they had that day of rest on the eighth. And so uh, I'm thinking that this is the seventh day. It's a solemn day of teaching, a highlight of the feast. But because the eighth day not be a regular part, um, that, I don't think that would be the greatest day. And so I assume it's the, the seventh day. So you get this picture. This is a seven-day-long feast. Jesus doesn't come to the feast until about midway through it. Uh, and so for the past seven days, the, the priest, remember, we talked about this last week, as we looked at the uh, pool of Siloam, how the priest has gone in his priestly garments. He's gone uh, ritualistically. Uh, symbolically, he's gone to the pool of Siloam. Remember that water in the pool of Siloam has come from uh, the, um, the, the spring, the Gihon spring, and it flowed through Hezekiah's tunnel, um, hundreds of years old, and it comes down to the pool of Siloam, rather large, what, what uh, Ellie Mae would call the cement pool, cement pond, and uh, people are there very ceremoniously. The uh, priest takes water in this golden uh, bowl and then marches, leads a procession back up to the altar in the temple. And there the crowds following him all the way up. And they watch as he pours out this, this libation, this offering, um, and drains it into the, the base of the altar. I, I think according to Isaiah 12, 3, where he says, Isaiah says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Well, that that, that fits our, our Lord, doesn't it? It fits Jesus as the, the well of our salvation. But the ceremony, uh, this procession, reminds us of uh, God's divine provision of water from a rock in the wilderness and, and uh, sort of playing off that public celebration. Jesus stands and shouts about the living water. In essence, he claims to be uh, the rock of uh, divine provision, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.4. Uh, think about water. I mean, uh, I, we take water for granted. Uh, it is such an essential uh, ingredient of life. Uh, we we have water everywhere, even though we live in central Texas. And uh, at my house, you know, since the rain quit a couple of weeks ago, um, my goats are saying, what's up here? All the grass has died and uh, even the weeds have died. And um, so we're we're beginning to give the goats a little more alfalfa now because Things are drying up. Uh, go to a desert area. If you've ever lived in places out in far west Texas, Arizona, uh, California, uh, dry, dry, dry. Uh, you, you appreciate water more there. Or go to some third world country. Uh, we just uh, returned in February from um, Haiti, and you, you don't 
drink the water there. In fact, that's why we were there. We went down to drill a water well for the people because uh, the water there, shallow water wells are contaminated, giving people all kinds of diseases and such. And so uh, water is important. We take it for granted because we can just turn on the faucet and out it comes. You can drink it straight from the faucet. And, and I, say, I doubt any of us are concerned about getting a disease from drinking water out of the tap, although many of us um, filter that water. But in Palestine, uh, it's not just refreshment. Uh, it, water is life. And likewise, the Holy Spirit is not nearly uh, as nice to have around. He gives us life. He's the source. And even to our, uh, uh, our bodies, according to Paul in Romans 8, uh, verses 10 and 11, uh, it, it is as if our spirits were um, dormant like um, like many of the trees you see, they go, go dormant uh, if it gets too dry. And then when the rains come, uh, they spring to life. Uh, we, we are dormant. We are dead because of the curse of death, uh, of sin. But after Jesus Christ's death pays the penalty for our sin, um, that curse is removed. And we can once again walk with God in the coolness of the day like um, the Bible talks about in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Um, we can do that through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, look at Revelation twenty-two seventeen. So again, uh, Jesus is at this great feast. Uh, it's a week-long feast. Uh, Jews coming from all over the area, and um, many of them have already turned away from him because he is, he is uh, showing himself not to be the Messiah that they want, uh, but he is showing himself to be the Messiah that, that God, the Father, um, sent him to be. And so, Let's look at who, who is this Jesus um, that is now proclaiming um, himself at the temple in Jerusalem. John chapter 7, verse 40 through 44. On hearing this, his, uh, his words, some of the people said, well, surely this man is the prophet. Uh, some manuscripts have a prophet, the prophet. Uh, verse 41, others said he is, he's the Christ uh, uh, or the Hebrew would be the Messiah. And still, still others ask, how can the Christ come from Galilee? So they, they, know, um, they know he's from Galilee in part by reputation, but also by his, um, his, um, his way of speech. Verse 42, does not the Scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Um, well, we, we know. Um, scripture tells us that he came from Bethlehem, but they don't know that. Verse 43, thus the people were, they were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, uh, but no one laid a hand on him. And, and by seize him, I think they're talking about wanting to arrest him. Uh, Jesus' words divided the crowd into these three groups based upon their interpretation, their opinion. Some think he is the prophet, uh, not far from, I think, a declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, they likely have Deuteronomy 16, 15 in mind. And others, they're willing to, um, to make their, uh, they're more convinced. They're willing to make their confession. And um, they say he is the Christ, the Messiah. And the third group denies any uh, of that and says that Jesus, uh, he couldn't be the Messiah because he's, well, he's from Galilee, right? And he's not from Bethlehem. But again, they, they don't understand. Um, and so they're ignorant about Jesus' true identity and his true history, his heritage. He is indeed uh, fulfilling of the prophecies, and he is the Messiah um, of, of Israel. So we wonder why Jesus, I, I do wonder why Jesus doesn't just explain to the folks in that crowd that day that, hey, I was born in Bethlehem. Uh, but I, I, I tend to think that they, they would not have believed anyway because um, so many of them had already seen signs and miracles and heard these teachings and still did not believe. Um, as the old saying goes, uh, don't confuse me with the facts. I've got my mind made up already. Um, that, that's many of us in the world today. Um, so now uh, let's watch this next scene as it plays out in John chapter 7, verse 45. He says, finally, the, the temple guards went back to the chief priest, uh, they're higher up, and the Pharisees, and uh, the, the, they asked them, why, why didn't you bring him in? Why didn't you arrest him? And the temple guards are saying, well, no one ever spoke the way this man does. Hmm. 
uh, verse 47, you mean he has deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Um, ha has any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No. Uh, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, remember he went by night, uh, he went to Jesus earlier and who was now one of their own number asked, verse 51, does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he is doing? And they replied, mm, are you too from Galilee? Uh, and look into it and you will find that a, a prophet does not come out of Galilee. So when the guards uh, returned empty-handed, the Pharisees and chief priests um, pretty much turned them. Why didn't you bring him? Uh, they're angry because they have yet, uh, here's another failure, another failed attempt to apprehend Jesus, to arrest him. And the guards believe, uh, they're convinced that he's, there's something about him, um, that he's not just a Galilean. They have open minds. The Pharisees and the, the chief priests, they, they do not. So the Pharisees attack the guards and they, they say, well, the crowds are a bunch of ignorant folks who, uh, who are already deceived. They're easily deceived, and they're cursed by their ignorance. They claim that there, there's no Pharisee uh, has believed in Jesus, but uh, they, they didn't know about Nicodemus, evidently. Uh, not only did he, Nicodemus, believe, but he uh, clearly indicated that there were others who believed. Nicodemus did in John chapter 3, and they state that... Uh, a prophet doesn't come out of G Galilee, but um, uh, I wonder why uh, we know, based on our understanding of Scripture, um, that Jonah came from Galilee, 2 Kings 14, 25, and possibly Hosea and uh, Nahum. Um, but here we are again, people with closed minds, hard heads, hard hearts. They have no room for the good news of, of God's love. And there are many people in the world that way today. Um, they are like the closed-minded people. Um, they have no room for God. Uh, we go back to um, the story of Jesus' birth. Uh, we like to sing at Christmas time about there, there's no room for, in the end, in the end, uh, end, the the hotel, the the place for him to sleep. There's no room in the end, and so um, w we say there's no room for Jesus in people's hearts. Um, in some way, God gives us the good news, and in some way, He gives us His grace. He gives us faith. He, give, he, he enables us to, to understand, and um, somewhere in there, there's that freedom for us to say no, uh, to, to make up our minds uh, against what God wants to do, and, and that's what many have done um, in, in Jesus' day and in our day. What is... What is our responsibility to people who've closed their hearts and minds to God? Uh, well, it's certainly to, to continue to um, work toward helping them to see that God loves them, that God cares for them, that God has sent His Son to die for them. Uh, we're, we're not to give up. Just as, just as uh, Jesus did not forgive up on us, God did not give up, has not given up on us, so we should not give up on the world around us. Uh, we're to keep praying. Uh, Coletti and I, um, in our morning prayer, we, um, I was recently, in back er, early spring, I think it was, introduced to a little app on my phone about um, it would identify my neighbors, uh, give me their address and their um, name, and so I can pray for them. Uh, you can do the same. Um, but anyway, we, we do that every morning. We pray for our neighbors and this morning, my prayer was, uh, Lord, as I pray for my neighbors, I pray that you'll help me be a good neighbor. I, to me, that, I think that's where it has to start. Not, Lord, just bless them, bless them, bless them, but Lord, help me to be the blessing to them. I am God's instrument of grace and love and good news to my neighbors, as are you. You are God's messenger. You are, uh, you are Christ's disciple. Uh, and remember, our mission, not just the worship place, but every Christian, our mission is to go and make disciples. We go tell the good news. 
of what Jesus has done for us, what he's doing in us, and invite people to um, open their hearts and their minds to God. God does the saving. All we do is the uh, introducing them to him, and they open their lives to him, and God, God does his miraculous work. Um, wow. To have been in Jerusalem that day and to hear Jesus uh, talking about uh, who he is, I have to ask myself, would I have been one of the hard-hearted, closed-minded people, religious people, or would I have been able to say, there's something different about this man. I want to know more. Don't know. But I say it is all by God's grace that today uh, I stand before you and uh, say more, more of God, more of our Lord Jesus. Fill me up, Lord. Uh, make me more like Jesus every day. That's all by his grace. And I invite you, too, to open your life anew this, this evening and to say, more of you, Jesus. Give me more of you. Remember, uh, I, I can't remember the exact context. Uh, was it John who said, John, um, who said, uh, he, he must, John the Baptist, wasn't it? He must increase and I must decrease. Let that be our prayer. More of Christ in us and through us. Pray with me. Our Lord and our Savior, we bow before you tonight to say thank you for your presence in our lives and your, your uh, amazing uh, spirit at work in our hearts and minds, uh, renewing us, uh, regenerating us, uh, giving us new life each day. Lord, we pray for more of you. Let there be more of you and less of me today. To God be the glory. Amen. Well, Wednesday evening, next time we get together, it will be summer 2020. Uh, we'll uh, pick up where we left off here. A lot of good things yet to come. So uh, God bless you and keep you. Here's a big hug for you. See you next week.